A regular contributor to radio, TV, newspapers, magazines and documentaries on business, economic and social issues, uh, Phil continues to be one of Australia's most frequent and prolific commentators in demand by the media and certainly one of the nation's most respected strategists and futurists on business, social and economic matters. And uh, certainly no one's been at it longer in this country. I think Phil's been at it 40 years and I wouldn't like to think it the first time he and I shared a stage. He's a board member of the Melbourne Institute, a director of Open Family Australia, the Charitable Foundation Aiding Street Children, and a recent director of CEDA. Would you please welcome Phil Riven. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kerry, and good morning, fellow speakers, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the future, in this case, looking out to 2025, uh, is, is always a challenge because I find that most people in any country have difficulty getting perspective about where the country is right now, let alone thinking out you know, much more than a year or two into the future. And so uh, I find people, when looking out to say, in this case, 2025 or 13 years from now, uh, can either be disbelieving about forecasts, and sometimes they prove to be right too, because not all forecasts are all that good, um, or else it terrifies them uh, with what the speaker is trying to say. I'll try and do both of those over the next 20 minutes, if that's all right. Um, but what I would like to share with you, if I may, are my thoughts on just four areas. I'll move through fairly quickly, uh, because I know copies of this are, are available, if any of the slides are of interest to you in an ongoing way. But I want to talk very briefly about some demographics, about employment and unemployment, and where the jobs are, and finally, the change in the working regimes. And I think perhaps my greatest uh, stirring comments or shock might come in the very last uh, topic, and, uh, but I've kept the engine running in the car outside, so that should be okay. Um, but firstly, some demographics, and I'm gonna go through stuff that I'm not sure is gonna surprise too many of us, but let's go through it anyway. Uh, the first one is to simply remind us that we are living much longer than anybody has done for centuries. We, as a result, are learning for longer periods of our live, lives, uh, not only in terms of the formal early education, which is what that uh, dotted line at the bottom shows, but of course, uh, lifelong learning is now uh, de rigueur, of course, uh, for all of us. Um, and we are, as a result of that, uh, of course, retiring at a later age as well. I mean, it is quite sobering to know that uh, just over 200 years ago, the life expectancy for both men and women was 38 years of age. That was life expectancy. And I've often explained that that's why there was no divorce in those days, because there wasn't time. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the interesting facts of life is that the average length of a marriage has never changed in the last 300 years across here in England. It's always been 20 years, um, which means that there's now time since we lived to 78 or 84, if you're a woman, uh, to have two trade-ins, if you like, along the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, what has changed, of course, more recently is that the women are doing the trading in more than the men, I think. Uh, and that serves us right. We ran the joint for 11,000 years. It's your turn. Now, um, I think the next point I want to make is that uh, we, we often hear about the fact we might run out of workers because of ageing during the course of this century. Uh, I'm here to tell you, and I'll reinforce that later on, that just is not going to happen. Any thought that we'll run out of workers is just, just not on. Um, <clears throat> we, we had a much worse problem back at the time of Federation, because we were struggling to even get four out of 10 citizens to be able to work, mainly because we were such a young society. And it was interesting that that Federation said that uh, you had to have compulsory education up to 15, because at that particular time, of course, we had something like 3% of the workforce that were under the age of 15, and quite a significant proportion under the age of 11. So we had struggle, a struggle to get enough people because of the youthfulness. We won't have a struggle because of ageing, the reason being, of course, unlike the year 1900, most work these days is not to do with brawn or heavy work, but it's to do with the brain, and the only way to wear that out is to stop using it. Uh, so I think that uh, the thought that we'll work on much longer than any other generation in history is not that hard to understand when you see it like that. Um, in terms of the, the gender mix-up, or mix of the uh, uh, workforce, of course, uh, again, not a lot of surprise there, except a quick reminder that in that dark blue sector, which are female married women or marrieds. Uh, of course, they were banned pretty well from being in the workforce until around about the mid-1960s. And uh, 
so uh, we are back to having, of course, participating married women in the workforce, as we did, of course, during the agrarian age, uh, way, way back uh, in the 1800s, where, of course, they more often than not either worked beside their husband on the farm or worked beside their husband in a, in a store somewhere. Uh, but these days, of course, you tend to work in totally different jobs, unlike the situation that existed back then. Anyway, just enough to say that women now constitute not half the workforce and probably never will for all the obvious reasons, uh, but it certainly brought a balance that we didn't have for a long, long time. Um, in terms of age groups, yes, you can see there the forecast out to the year 2041 that we are expecting a higher proportion of our workforce to be uh, in the sort of older brackets. Uh, with even that red zone being over 65 starting to, to increase noticeably at that time as well. Uh, there's been a shrinkage in the younger proportion, the younger age groups, and that's mainly because they're staying at uh, school and particularly universities now longer than they've ever done before. Interesting enough, again, by the middle of this century, not quite, by around about 2040, we'd expect the average age of the workforce to be about 42, whereas we went back to uh, early part of the last century, the average age was about uh, something like about 31, I think it is. Enough of that. Um, higher education, that's already been mentioned by previous speakers uh, here this morning. Yes, we've got something close to 5.5% of the population at university. You should take something off, of course, because of the foreign students, and there's almost uh, 300,000 of those. But even so, that's a very, very steep uh, curve showing how important uh, tertiary education has now become uh, here in Australia. Um, I think the challenge there, and that has been raised also uh, by the panel just before the morning tea break, is uh, how are we going to change universities or how are they going to change in the light of some international situations, not the least of which, of course, is, is, is being pointed out free courses coming in over the internet, of course. Uh, I think we'll get enormous competition, of course, from China. Uh, they'll be miles and miles ahead of us in quality of universities uh, probably within the next 10 years. Um, for any number of reasons I can explain. Uh, I think we're caught in a very tr great trap here. We've got almost $60 billion worth of money tied up across our 38 campuses for a total revenue of only $24 billion each year. That ratio is so, so lazy uh, as to be terrifying to me. Um, it's, a, it's a very lazy use of assets. And as I think we move into uh, more virtual education, which will include the tutoring that uh, Kerry so rightly raised, your tutoring can be done by telepresence as well. Again, you don't need a campus, or if you do, it could be at a local coffee shop anyway. Um, but uh, we have got some real challenges uh, to the university sector, I think, to keep up with the challenges that I think the, the whole workforce is going to face over this, uh, over this next 13, let alone more years beyond that. Uh, I think, really, the goal for university has to be to halve the price of a university education within the next eight to ten years. Uh, I think the time to get your undergraduate degree should be cut by a third, which already Bond University does, of course, as we know. Uh, we have to really look at, at, at tertiary education with a completely, I think, fresh, uh, a fresh approach. Otherwise, we are going to get run over by the rest of the world or just find it's, it's just too expensive for what it's, it's actually producing. Uh, I spoke to the Vice-Chancellor's uh, biennial conference last year. Again, I had the car running, of course, outside. I wasn't that stupid. Um, because I did, I did suggest that we won't probably have serious competition until all the universities are listed on the stock exchange. Um, and you could, <clears throat> I think they're still trying to catch their breath, and that was about a year and a half ago. Um, but nevertheless, I, I simply want to say there is a big challenge when we're looking at the workforce of the future, and you can't decouple that from the challenges that are taking place in the tertiary institutions. Um, now, another thing about, uh, if you like, um, it's almost a demographic thing, but... Um, Work has been a constant. Just as I said, marriage, marriages have never changed from being 20 years over the last 300 years. The other thing that's never changed over the last three centuries has been the amount of work that people do in their lifetime. It has always been between 125 to 130,000 hours. That has never changed from 1788 to 2012. Um, never, ever changed. And that's a combination of paid and unpaid work. Down the bottom, I'm simply going to make the point that... Uh, the ratio between paid and unpaid work differs between the genders, of course. Uh, but for men, uh, which have been in paid work for that entire period, uh, it's always been around about 75 to 80,000 hours of paid work, and the rest, of course, has been unpaid work, like household duties or whatever. Whereas for women, that ratio has been somewhat different, and still is, of course. But the amount of work has never, ever changed. 
all that's changed is, is how, how much we have to squeeze into a year. Because when you only lived to 38, uh, certainly when it came to paid work, you had to work a 65 hour week, non-stop for 52 weeks of the year. And you just got it in by the time 38, and then uh, you carked it and went to God. Because um, there was no retirement at all in those days, of course, unless you're one of the filthy rich. Um, and there weren't too many of those either. Whereas today, we don't spread that work over 25 years like they used to, because they used to start work at 13 and finish at 38 when they died, on average. Um, we now start work nearer to the 20 age group, and we carry it out over not 25 years, but 50 years. So we still do the 75 to 80,000 hours, we just spread it over twice as long a period of time. And you still hear a lot of people saying, oh, we're working harder now than our parents ever did, you know. Um, well, I'm here to tell you that facts are in a good story, and I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit later um, to show that that's simply not true. The average hours of work have been going down steadily every year of my lifetime, and I'll show you a graph to prove that shortly. But we, we do, particularly we're in that very hard working age group, like 40 onwards to maybe 55 when, um, when the kids are at their most demanding. Uh, you are running around, you're dropping them off to football, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're trying to juggle it left, right and centre, and you get the impression that nobody's ever had to work that hard in their life. But uh, if you take your entire lifetime, not true, we now work less each year than we've ever done in history. More about that uh, if I come, come later a bit on. And this graph simply shows that. This graph shows the number of hours we live, um, and uh, down the bottom you can see in that light green area, that's the amount of hours we worked, and that goes all the way back to 1788, now to the year 2088, so I'm being a bit brave with that forecast. But what I'm suggesting is uh, the amount of work always is going to be 80,000 hours plus another 50,000 or whatever it turns out to be for unpaid work, which is the area just above it, um, but it's a constant. And that's good news because you can see the amount of time we've got for leisure is now growing and growing and growing all the time, as we see in that yellow area. So life is getting a whole lot better for most of us. Now, paid working hours, I said I'd come back to it. This is the average working hours of the 11.4 million Australian workers today, uh, or whatever it was back in the 70s, because it was fewer than that. Uh, and you can see that red area is drifting down bit by bit by bit all the time. So the average working week today is around about 32 hours per week. Uh, and that includes part-time and full-time people, but of course, uh, if you take a complete year into account, we've got to remember there's two months a year that are off work completely. Four weeks annual leave, two weeks um, public holidays, of course, being the 10 public holidays, and of course, uh, two weeks sick leave, which of course everybody takes as holidays as we know here in Australia, um, uh, or, or a lot of people do, put it that way, um, RDOs or whatever you want to call them. But, um, Nevertheless, uh, you can see that the amount of work is continuing to drop as it's done really for centuries um, per, per year. It takes me into employment and unemployment and where that's going. I think first of all, let's look at unemployment over the last whatever, maybe uh, 140 years or something, 120 years, but it's a fair bit. And you can see the periods of massive unemployment being, of course, the 1890s depression, that peak way back there when it hit uh, something almost like 19% unemployment. The 1930s depression, of course, when it went very similarly close to, the, uh, to 18 or 19 per cent. But the, the period really uh, where it was high again, which was of course 1977 to 2007, is an odd spreading out of unemployment because that period uh, shouldn't have had any unemployment of that type at all. And the reason we had unemployment at that time was because of bloody mindedness. Uh, you had a, a really fixed approach to work by unions, by employers and by government. Uh, the whole idea of, of creating part-time jobs, which now constitute almost 30% of the workforce in Australia, and that's not the highest in the world because uh, Holland's up around about 36%, uh, so we've got a fair way to go yet. But there was no job sharing being tolerated back in those, that 70s and 80s, which is appalling. Uh, and, and companies weren't helping either, to the extent that we now take for granted uh, in, in all sorts of areas, whether it be hospitality or, or banks or supermarkets or whatever. Uh, unions have certainly uh, didn't see part-time jobs uh, as being a real job. And I found that atrocious in those days because that was really saying to working mums, if you've got a part-time job, you're a second-class citizen. So the attitude to part-time work was simply appalling. So I'd simply say that we should never have had that unemployment from 1977 to 2007. Had we had a better view of the future, had we been more open-minded, which I think one would hope these days in 2012 we are, and in particular with a, uh, a forum like this one looking out to 2025, we would never want to commit those sins again, in my opinion. It was just a disgraceful period in Australia's history and an unnecessary period of pain and suffering across the community. 
I don't think we're going to have any unemployment worth spitting at for the next 25 to 30 years. Uh, I think between now and roughly 2045, uh, you'd have to be a totally inept government and society to have any unemployment for the rest of this time. I'm not saying it won't jump up half or 1% every now and again because of exogenous shocks of the sort that have been touched on in the, in the, the, the session just before at morning tea. But I, I'm generally saying I can see, I think, full employment pretty well for at least the next one, if not two generations out for almost uh, 30 to 35 years. Enough of that. Um, I've mentioned also we're not going to run out of workers because if you look at the participation rate in Australia, and I'm not here talking about the proportion of people aged between 15 and 65 or over 15, I'm talking about the entire population of men, women and children. And the reason I do that is if you go back far enough in history, as I said, you've got to allow for the fact that we had to employ, sadly, people under the age of 15 just to be able to keep the society alive. And that's why we were employing you know, 11, 12 and 13 year olds uh, you know, back in the uh, 19th century. But here you can see that we, we did have a little bit of a struggle at the beginning of that chart, trying to get up to four out of 10 of members of society to be able to work to support them and the other six. Whereas today, you know, we're getting awfully close up to around about 55% of the population. I've coloured in the part that is, uh, if you like, part-time, being orange. And if you convert that back to full-time, we're still doing better than we did perhaps 100 years ago. Uh, there's no sign, in my opinion, that we are going to run out of workers at all this century, as I said earlier. Uh, I remain very, very optimistic about that because I don't think ageing is necessarily a problem uh, to work, particularly since most jobs are now cerebral. Uh, enough of that. Workforce by generations is even more interesting to me because if you break up the workforce according to the, the sort of generations that are cohabiting uh, today, well, baby boomers are still the biggest single uh, cohort, but only just because the, the Gen Xs are coming up behind very fast. And that's mainly because the baby boomers are starting to retire, of course. Um, or those that can afford to. Um, the yellow generation is even more scary. That's the net generation. Um, and um, I used to call them the ferals, actually. Um, and, uh, and not because they're wild animals, but really because they're the, they're, they're the first generation in history to be totally unconstrained by time, space, and distance. They were literally born as world children. I mean, you go to the hospital and you wouldn't ask whether it's male or female a boy or a girl, you'd simply say, uh, what's that PC in its lap and what sort of a phone's got hanging off each ear? Uh, and as you know, they'd be the most savvy generation we've ever seen, and they are truly a scary mob. Uh, get, getting them to work as a uh, productive team is an interesting challenge, uh, as we know, and I think that's as much the fault of the, of the bosses of today who don't, just don't understand uh, the net generation. Now, the net generation, you know, they, they can be a reasonably insolent lot sometimes, uh, and if anybody is sure they've got to know how they tick, would you please let me know and I'll pay you a lot of money. Um, because almost all of my employees in my firm worldwide are in fact uh, the net generation. What I do know is if you get onto their wavelength and you can give them the incentive and you've got the right culture, they will outperform every, uh, any other generation that we've ever seen by a margin that's really scary. Uh, they are truly a competent, clever, smart bunch. Uh, but the, the management of them is not easy. Uh, and um, I'm going to finish off shortly when I get to part four, by 20 past five today, um, the, um, the, the whole challenge about how you treat a worker you know, in the future going into 2025. Enough of that in a moment. Changing jobs, yes, we do change jobs, and it always gets easier when you've got full employment. Uh, now, baby boomers would know that because we did have full employment when they were entering the workforce in the mid-60s and were able to job hop a fair bit. Um, Full employment always brings the, uh, the, the propensity anyway to, to job hop a fair bit. And I'm not going to go through those stats. Uh, they uh, are produced anyway by the ABS. And, um, but they are a, a, a reminder that we have a very mobile, uh, if not volatile, but certainly a very mobile workforce uh, in the country. Uh, that takes me into the third area, where the jobs and the money are now and into the future. Now, this first chart goes all the way back to the year 1800. And it has a look at the mix of our industries, not by jobs in this particular case, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of the uh, economy according to value added from each industry, but that's still largely driven by wages and employment anyway. But it's enough to remind us that over the last 220 years or so, we have seen a very dramatic change in the mix of industries in Australia. Long gone are the red areas, which are either agricultural or mining, uh, which of course was during our agrarian age, Long gone are now the orange-coloured ones, uh, which of course was the industrial age of manufacturing, 
uh, of course, and uh, construction and utilities, like construction is doing well. Uh, but manufacturing's already shrunk from what was 30% of the economy when I left university in 1960 to um, down to 8% today, as we'll see shortly. So uh, we have gone through a number of quite distinct eras or ages of progress. Um, the green area is, is really what we might call the quaternary sector, uh, being jobs that are to do with either information or with finance. And the blue area are more to do with what we might call the outsourcing of household services. Um, things such as obviously hospitality and entertainment, more particularly is now health, because when I was growing up, uh, your GP, your specialist and your hospital was your mother. And you only went outside your mother you know, if you had a broken leg, and then you'd wait for two days to make sure it was. Uh, uh, these days, of course, you'd be off there for the slightest sniffle. Uh, so we are outsourcing, you know, huge amounts of health that we once used to insource. And the same with entertainment, as we know. I mean, entertainment, when I was growing up, was singing around the piano or playing cards. Uh, uh, and now, nobody you know what you're talking about. But um, so we are, that blue area is, is increasingly the outsourcing. And again, in that pre-morning uh, tea session, uh, when I think it was Michael was asked about whether uh, where the jobs had come from. We are continually outsourcing in any modern society, and uh, Britain was mentioned by you, Michael, but uh, we, we create most jobs anyway by outsourcing. Um, I mean, people would not know, for example, that last year in the year 2011, for the first time in our history, we spent more money on outsourced services from the home than we did on the entire retail sector for the first time in history. Um, and uh, we were spending well over $25,000 per family on getting a house clean, lawns mown, cars washed, babysitting, uh, entertainment, eating out and all the rest of it. We were spending over 25000 per family. That's more than all retail sales, excluding motor cars. And uh, so the world has changed. We keep creating new jobs all the time. And we've only outsourced one third of all the household chores so far. So we're not going to run out of jobs from that reason alone for a long, long time. And long after the mining boom's gone, there's a big source of... Uh, income overseas for Australia, uh, we'll be taking in tourism at a phenomenal pace, particularly the Chinese. And my prediction still is that before the year 2030, we'll be earning more money from inbound tourism from Asia than we do earn today from all of our exports combined uh, of mining. So uh, uh, we ought not be fearful about the future. We should only be fearful if we don't see these things coming, we don't plan for them, or we fight them when they do come uh, unnecessarily. The jobs as they are today in the year 2012, as at June, uh, are shown in that diagram. And again, you can see the vast predominant uh, employment is now in the service industries. The yellow area is what we call commerce, being wholesaling, retailing and transport. The green area I've already described as being industries that are, have a very high content of either information or finance. And the blue areas being uh, the outsourcing by households from the home. Uh, I should be careful about that because even in the orange area in manufacturing, that industry was only born because we outsourced manufacturing from the home because we tend to forget these days we used to make our own preserved food at home before we had a food in industry. We used to make our own clothes from bolts of cloth that came in from England before we had a textile clothing and footwear industry. So most industries anyway are created by outsourcing as, as we perhaps we tend to forget. But again, th that is dramatic. And again, I make the point that most jobs are now cerebral will have a high cerebral content, which means the ageing of a community is no real threat to uh, having enough workers because we don't have that many heavy jobs anymore. And oh and means that uh, even the heavy jobs, they're not going to break your back or, or, or bone uh, anyway, like they might have done in the olden days. Uh, enough of that. New jobs, where were they created over the last... In this case, the last five years, well, it stands out. It's been health and social assistance, but particularly health, which created by far and away, and they'll continue to create the most jobs. In fact, it is the single largest occupation now in Australia, overtaking manufacturing and retailing. Professional and technical services uh, also created an awful lot of jobs, and that's the field in which I'm in, because we're an online database company. Education has grown, again, uh, mainly because of the universities, of course. Mining has grown for all the reasons we know. Public administration and safety has been growing and so on. Down to the bottom where we've been shedding jobs, obviously in manufacturing, certainly in media and telecommunications, which is absorbing, if you like, labour saving technology at a, at a frightening pace. Agriculture, because it's still continuing to become more mechanised, etc. So it's just a reminder again that the world's changing uh, into, into a, a new era yet again. Where's the money? Well, it's in mining at the present time. It's so far in front of anything else, it's unbelievable. And if you look at the average pay for mining compared to, say, agriculture, hospitality or retail at the bottom, uh, you've certainly got a, a two-speed economy, if you like, uh, certainly the way uh, wages are paid out. Um, 
And, uh, but again, uh, it's, it's mostly the new age industries that are paying the highest money, which means we should never be afraid of losing the old ones, except for perhaps emotional reasons. I mean, manufacturing is now earning less than the average wage across Australia, which means preserving those jobs at any cost is damning the society to, uh, to, to a, a worse future than it's been in. And uh, I just don't see the sense of that. Uh, I'm certainly one of those that thinks protecting a car industry that uh, uh, is way over its use by date is, is, is almost immoral because you're, you're draining off money that should go into a growth industry to create jobs for the future, not uh, dying jobs for the, from the past, great as they would have been to society at the time. Enough of that. Um, the importance of occupations in Australia, I don't spend a lot of time on this, except to say, yes, that's shifting as well, like the uh, proportion of managers and owners and professionals, if you like, uh, have been growing uh, faster than the areas at the bottom which are being displaced by technology, as we well know. I'm not going to teach you anything you don't know. Yes, we are going to need higher qualifications moving out to 2025. Uh, I've simply adapted some information from Skills Australia to produce this chart, but simply to make the point that um, each of those areas of occupations do have, if you like, uh, a threshold at which tertiary uh, qualification or post-secondary qualifications are important, and that will only be extended over the next 25 years. Uh, more so in areas like community and personal, which does include health, for example, uh, and to some extent too in the clerical and administration, because with the advent of fast broadband and new analytics that are emerging, uh, then the, the clerical and administration uh, skill base is really going to have to require more higher uh, education as well. But I'm not going to tell an audience like this anything that you don't know in that field. I'm going to finish, as I said I would, on the working regimes, and this is where I've got the car running. Um, but um, I think the greatest challenge we're going to have going forward, if I was to list the greatest challenge, it's, it's facing up to the inevitable emergence of worker freedom. Now, I'm old enough to remember when a monumental change took place in the mid-60s as the industrial age came to an end and the new age began. And that age was not to do with the workers so much, but it was to do with the move from being a production-oriented economy to what you call a consumer or market-oriented economy. And of course, we, it wasn't too far after that when uh, companies were banned from putting a fixed price on a product before it left the factory, for example, that was banned. And you suddenly put power into the consumer, not into the producer. And that took an enormous amount of adjustment by, uh, by producers, particularly manufacturers, over a period of some two decades to get used to it. What I'm suggesting now, as we move through this century, is we're moving away from what I might call bondage by businesses, bosses and unions to freedom. Uh, and I think even the term employee is going to disappear out of use by sometime after the second half of this century. Uh, what we probably don't realise, as comfortable as you might be with a high standard of living by world standards today, is that we are still, in a sense, experiencing the last vestiges by sla of slavery when we call ourselves an employee. Uh, all that's changed is that um, we're allowed to go home at night and they pay us more money. Um, but, you know, there are still times like you've got to turn up by 8 or 7.30 or this or whatever and you've got to go home at this time and this is when you can have a tea break. I mean, it's, it's, it's slavery. Uh, it's as simple as that. It's the last vestige of slavery. Now, the baby boomers don't see it that way but you're not the generation we're talking about in 2025. We're talking about the Gen Xs and the Net Gen. And uh, I can tell you, because my, my, my company worldwide is full of them, um, you, could not, you cannot treat people that way anymore. It just doesn't work. Um, now, it might work you know, for somewhat longer, maybe another 10, 15 years, but it's slowly diminishing. Um, and what we really have to face, the biggest single challenge is not the change of occupations, change of, um, of industries and all this, God knows, that's, they're monumental too. It's, it's changing the way we look at workers. Um, now look, I for one, I'm a bit sorry that slavery's gone, because um, you can't own the employees. Um, what that's been replaced by is the only thing you can own in a company, and that's the culture. Because if you own a unique culture, it's something that makes people want to turn up every day of the week with a smile on their face, and to tell all their mates that you're a great, great place to work. That's what you can control. And if we don't get the culture right, you know, going forward, uh, you're not going to get your company right at all. Um, so I'm not going to go through that last slide to any great uh, extent, except to say that we are going to see a shift away in the final slide from what we take as employees for granted. Um, and, and whilst that's become enormous over the last uh, period of time, 
particularly uh, those that are, if you like, well, sorry, it's not the employees have grown, it's those that are unionised have, have collapsed from something like 55% of the workforce in 1960 uh, down to a, a you know, level of around about 16% today. Uh, unions probably won't exist by the middle of the century, they'll probably be gone. So to all employer bodies which are looking after the employers, they're both probably outlive their usefulness already. Because if you start to look at employees as being given their ultimate freedom, needing a little bit of advice from what you might call advisors, in the same way that we have financial advisors looking after our superannuation, uh, you'll see that unless unions or employer bodies can change their entire charter, there is no point in having either of them uh, you know, by the middle of this century. So I leave you that last challenge. I think it's worker freedom, how you manage that for their benefit and yours and the societies at large, that's going to be one of the greatest challenges we have moving to 2025 and beyond. Thanks for listening. So that. We've, just, we've, we've just got a few minutes. I'll, I'll quickly see if there's a question from the audience because I've got a couple myself, but have we got any? I'll give you one more chance. I'm going to ask a, a question, then come back to you, and then we'll have to wind it. Um, one thing you said quite early, uh, Phil, was uh, uh, that the Chinese will be miles ahead of us in terms of tertiary education in yeah. the next 10 years. Yes. I, are you talking about the quality of tertiary education and why? Um, I think, firstly, the Chinese, even though we think of them as a manufacturing economy, for the last five years have had literally thousands of their smartest brains going around the world finding out how to move into a service industry because they realised that manufacturing would be taken off them like it's taken off everybody eventually by Pakistan, Vietnam, Bangladesh. So they're already preparing now to give up manufacturing, even though that might be another 20 years away. And they're realising that most money is earned out of service industries, not out of manufacturing anyway. So they uh, have decided they're going to build universities um, more based uh, on very, very highly paid professional uh, teachers. And they're prepared to pay whatever it takes to get the smartest teachers into universities. We're not prepared to do that at this stage. And we're prepared to have too many courses with too few students in them to be able to get economies of scale into our education. So we could lose what's a $4.5 billion export market you know, very, very quickly in Australia by our students wanting to go over there because it'll be less expensive and possibly a better education. Now, there's going to be a lot of arguing about that in this room, and I understand that, um, but the car is running out the front. Um, the other countries like Korea, for example, already, when we won't have fast broadband until 2021, already in South Korea, they've got 100 megabits per second now to every single home in South Korea. Finland's got 1,000 gigabits per second, or uh, megabits per gigabit, uh, now available to any bits. home, bits, sorry, and um, which means that, uh, why did South Korea do that? Because they did not want a fortune committed to campuses, which nobody uses. They wanted to be able to do it by telepresence, which they're doing. So uh, we've got the Asian society moving ahead of us in leaps and bounds in an industry we thought we owned in Asia, and we won't own it at all by the 2020s if we're not careful. And just, just very quickly, I, I know one of the great things that futurists have going for them is that by the time uh, we're going to find out how right you are. Of course, I'll be dead probably, but uh, how can you so easily dismiss the manufacturing industry in the way you have? I mean, you said the car industry. There is an argument that, uh, that the car industry does a lot more than just produce a car. There is a skills base that comes from manufacturing, which surely is absolutely fundamental uh, to a healthy country. You, know, you can't just wipe out manufacturing industry like that. Somebody's got to be making things. Yes, they do. But, um I think we're talking about intellectual property, really. Uh, I've often pointed out that, uh, to people that forget there is no such thing as a goods industry in any country of the world. It's a very much a human uh, construct to describe that. See, mining's not really a goods industry because miners think they make the iron ore and export it. They didn't. God made it and gave it to us for free. Uh, in other words, iron ore's only got a price on it because somebody's dug it up and had to put some capital in there to depreciate. Yeah. So mining, of course, is a service industry. It's like Grace Brothers removals. They just pick up stuff here and they move it to there and charge for it. Um, and I'm exaggerating slightly, but you can see what I'm driving at. Yeah. The same with manufacturing. We don't make anything. We simply convert things using labour and skill. So what you want to preserve is the skills, and you're quite right. But I look at our defence department. Have we got a submarine that works? Have we got a freighter that works for more than about five years before it breaks down? Uh, I'm not sure that we're preserving much that you could class as world's best practice at all. Uh, and if you're that smart, 
take your skills over overseas. You better ring the driver and get the car going. Oh, yeah, I think I better, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're out of time on questions, Sorry I'm afraid, that, but would you all please thank Sorry, Phil River yeah. very much. Thanks, Phil. Just hang on. Okay, there you go. Don't forget your chocolates. <laughs> now, our next session is a short video, and it'll give us, uh, I think, a valued international perspective uh, from a leading voice on the workforce of the future. Uh, Professor Linda Gratton founder, is founder of the Hotspots Movement, uh, Professor of Management Practice from London Business School and author of The Shift, The Future of Work is Already Here. Uh, now the Australian Workforce and Productivity Agency has worked uh, with Linda to produce two videos for this conference to give us a sense of what she sees will be the major influences on the future of work and in this first video which uh, will help set up the next session that follows with Tony Jones and the Q&A a discussion focusing on uh, the five forces that will fundamentally change the way we work in the next 10 to 15 years. Here's the video. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, address you today. The thing you said quite early, uh, Phil, was uh, uh, that the Chinese will be miles ahead of us in terms of tertiary education in yeah. the next 10 years. Yes. I, are you talking about the quality of tertiary education and why? Um, I think, firstly, the Chinese, even though we think of them as a manufacturing economy, for the last five years have had literally thousands of their smartest brains going around the world finding out how to move into a service industry because they realise that manufacturing will be taken off them like it's taken off everybody eventually by Pakistan, Vietnam, Bangladesh. So they're already preparing now to give up manufacturing, even though that might be another 20 years away. And they're realising that most money is earned out of service industries, not out of manufacturing anyway. So they uh, have decided they're going to build universities um, more based uh, on very, very highly paid professional uh, teachers. And they're prepared to pay whatever it takes to get the smartest teachers into universities. We're not prepared to do that at this stage. And we're prepared to have too many courses with too few students in them to be able to get economies of scale into our education. So we could lose what's a four and a half billion dollar export market, you know, very, very quickly in Australia by our students wanting to go over there because it'd be less expensive and poss possibly a better education. Now, there's going to be a lot of arguing about that in this room, and I understand that, um, but the car is running out the front. Um, the other countries like Korea, for example, already when we won't have fast broadband until 2021, Already in South Korea, they've got 100 megabits per second now to every single home in South Korea. Finland's got 1,000 gigabits per second, or so megabits, which is a gigabit, uh, now available to any, any home. Bits, sorry. And, um, which means that, uh, why did South Korea do that? Because they did not want a fortune committed to campuses, which nobody uses. They wanted to be able to do it by telepresence, which they're doing. So uh, we've got the Asian society moving ahead of us in leaps and bounds in an industry we thought we owned in Asia, and we won't own it at all by the 2020s if we're not careful. And just, just very quickly, I, I know one of the great things that futurists have going for them is that by the time uh, we're going to find out how right you are, of course, I'll be dead probably, but uh, how can you so easily dismiss the manufacturing industry in the way you have? I mean, you said the car industry. There is an argument that, uh, that the car industry does a lot more than just produce a car. There is a skills base that comes from manufacturing, which surely is absolutely fundamental uh, to a healthy country. You know, you can't just wipe out manufacturing industry like that. Somebody's got to be making things. Yes, they do. But, um, I think we're talking about intellectual property, really. Uh, I've often pointed out that uh, to people that forget there is no such things as a goods industry in any country of the world. It's a very much a human um, construct to describe that. See, mining's not really a goods industry because. Miners think they make the iron ore and export it. They didn't. God made it and gave it to us for free. Uh, in other words, iron ore's only got a price on it because somebody's dug it up and had to put some capital in there to depreciate. So mining, of course, is a service industry. It's like Grace Brothers removals. They just pick up stuff here and they move it to there and charge for it. Um, and I'm exaggerating slightly, but you can see what I'm driving at. Yeah. The same with manufacturing. We don't make anything. We simply convert things using labour and skill. So what you want to preserve is the skills, and you're quite right. But I look at our defence department, We've got a submarine that works. We've got a freighter that works for more than about five years before it breaks down. Uh, I'm not sure that we're preserving much that you could class as world's best practice at all. Uh, and if you're that smart, take your skills over overseas. You better ring the driver and get the car oh, going. Yeah, I think I better, yeah. <laughs>